On booting the blue and the gray for the first time, it's apparent that the gang at Impressions whip their artists extra hard on this project. From the opening screen, it looks good, better almost than a war game ought to. Special attention has been given to the design of the interface. Note the windows like pull down menus, scroll bars, and alt key shortcuts. This makes controlling the game simple and intuitive. As might be expected, however, its good looks and ease of use come at the cost of performance. The game ran very slowly on my 486.33 with 8 megabytes of RAM. To make matters worse, the game's controls and buttons do not flash or push. With no immediate feedback, the interface feels tentative. You're often left wondering whether a mouse click really registered or not. As with any war game, the objective of the blue and the gray is to win the war for your side, whichever side that might be. You can play against the computer or a friend, or you can reenact historical battles of the war. The Battle of Bull Run is included, and Impressions plans to release data disks on additional battles. You can tell how well you are doing by looking at the victory bar, found strangely on the recruitment screen. Maybe they just didn't have room for it anywhere else. The arrow points to the loser. The closer the arrow is to the losing side, the closer the game is to being over. You move the bar by winning battles and taking cities. Another good indicator of how well you are doing is the stats screen accessed through the main menu. This screen shows losses for both sides by unit type. You have until April 1865 to crush your opponent. If no one wins by then, the side with the advantage is awarded a technical victory. Gameplay takes place on both strategic and tactical levels. At the strategic level, you manage troop movement, recruitment, army organization, and optionally, supply lines in traditional alternating turn mode. Troop movement is simple and elegant. Each division gets a number of movement points every turn. Each square costs X points to move into based on terrain type. Left click where you want your division to end up, and it goes as far toward that spot as it has movement points. Among the nicer features are a grid which can be toggled on and off, and the ability to scroll through your divisions one at a time using these buttons. An option to skip units with zero movement points remaining, however, would have made this feature even more useful. Movement does have a few flaws. Trains can't negotiate anything trickier than a straight line. Along winding tracks, they must be moved one square at a time. This is tedious since the game lacks keyboard shortcuts. Also, ships get 10 movement points per turn, but all viable squares cost them 2 points. Huh? Why not just give them 5 movement points and charge 1 per square? Recruitment is a little more complex. At the beginning of the second and subsequent months, each side gets a number of new recruits. These may be allocated to existing divisions, used to create new divisions, or sent for training. Men sent for training show up three months later, but at a higher quality than other entry-level troops. Army organization is baffling. In theory, it's nice to be able to reassign troops, split units into smaller units, raise multiple armies, and rename divisions and commanders. In practice, I haven't noticed any noteworthy effect this has on gameplay. The game has two reality options which can be toggled on and off. Supply lines adds the element of logistics to the game. Units in enemy territory must maintain a supply line or they will lose troops to starvation. The Fog of War option simply makes your opponent's troops invisible unless they are within two square miles of one of your own division. Serious war gamers will really appreciate these features. When opposing forces come into conflict, the battle is resolved in the tactical module. This is the micro-miniature system you've been hearing so much about. Its goal is to make computerized battles run like miniatures battles only without the lead. A worthwhile ambition at which Impressions has partially succeeded. The first step in playing out a battle is setup. At this point, pieces are arrayed as desired for the beginning of the battle. This can be time consuming, so fortunately there is an auto setup option called Quick Fight, which places troops for you. During setup, divisions can be combined to reduce the number of groups which must be moved. Unfortunately, this is the one major breakdown of the interface. As you can only view one division at a time, combining divisions requires scrolling to the first one, selecting it, and scrolling to the piece to combine with. Finally, there is no way to chip pieces off to form smaller groups. Once your forces are prepared, it's time to issue orders. Select a group by right-clicking on any piece in it, left-click anywhere on the battlefield, and a row of X's appears indicating the group's destination. You control what weapon a piece uses and how close it must get to an enemy before it attacks. You then start the clock moving and the battle is fought in real time. If at any time things aren't going your way, a mouse click or key press stops the action so you can reissue new orders. The battle can be followed in either a scrolling overhead view or an overview which shows the entire battlefield in less detail. The only letdown, of course, is that it is naturally sluggish. Combine this with the fact that a piece must be crushed down to bare bones to be destroyed, and battles can last forever. 
Taking as long to play the Civil War as it took to fight it is not a realism option I admire. Fortunately, you can reduce the detail level, which will improve speed somewhat, or skip battles entirely by hitting autoplay. The Blue and the Gray is a very ambitious game. While it hasn't fallen on its face, I can't proclaim it the best thing since sliced bread either. It has an extremely well-crafted interface, but like many games of this complexity level, it is cluttered with small and annoying details that detract from the fun of playing it. Chief among these is its poor speed on anything but a top-of-the-line machine. In spite of this, it does have the potential to be a lot of fun.